tonight's subject <coughs> is his causation in alcohol. I say that it is. I firmly believe that imagining creates reality. And it is my hope that before we close on the 26th of May, that everyone here will be able to share with me some perfectly wonderful case history. The all can testify to the greedy power of imagining. That the power will be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I know it can be done. The Renaissance and I lay the foundation for our claims. The claims are extravagant, but I assure you they are true. The Mother Digital was a speaker. They were always so. I found them in the greatest book in the world, in the Bible. That the ultimate source of phenomena of all sorts is one with the magic that is active in you and me. That imagination, why, is, and always will be the primary source of everything that comes into our life. There aren't two sources, there aren't two causes, there aren't two gods. So when you speak of the Lord in the scripture, the other person thinks in terms of some external being. Can't quite visualize it, but something external to himself. So let us turn now to the book. Did you say, he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Here the evangelist John declares, that all things without exception were made by him who from all eternity was with God. But who is God then? He said God is the first, and we speak now of a person in the third person by him. What is this person? Who is it? If I hear you, the God is your own wonderful human imagination. And God in action is simply imagining. In the scripture it is called Christ. If you study it carefully, Christ is defined for us in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians as the power and the wisdom of God. So God in action is called Christ. Imagination in action is imagining. That is Christ, if you want to use the word. But now we will go back to the great book of Isaiah. It is said in the 53rd chapter, which is called by all scholars the great messianic chapter, where one suffers for others. And we are told that the Lord placed upon him the iniquities of us all. The Lord placed upon him, but well, it seems to be another, our iniquity. If you stop there, you think in terms of what the church tells you, that some being 2,000 years ago to define self, our sins, our iniquities, our mischief, our wickedness, and there he expiates them. It is body. But now you mustn't stop there. Let us read the book carefully. We are told that he has no form that we should look upon him. No form that we should look upon him. And no beauty that we should desire him. Now let us turn over from the 53rd chapter to the 64th chapter. And you listen to it carefully. There is none there is no one that calls upon thy name, 
and bestows himself to take hold of thee. Thou hidest thy face from us, and delivers us into the hand of our iniquity. Now the iniquities were placed upon him. Now we are told in the same book, Thou delivered us into thy hand. Our iniquities delivered upon us. Now, listen to this carefully. Yet, O Lord, thou art our father. We are the clay. And thou art our potter. We are all the work of thy hand. Now the word translated Lord is I am. Yes, Lord, thou art our Father. The word is I am. Father is my source, my begetter, my creator. The word translated Potter, thou art our Potter. The word translated Potter means imagination. So I am in our self form is first to assume that it is man to have form. But I am in itself has no form. So the point to say, if thou humblest thyself, thou humblest me. Thou too dwellest in eternity. Thou art a man. God is no more. Thy own humanity, learn to adore, is no more. You are a man. God is no more. God is man. So the man is I am. But he becomes personified. And the personification of I am is man. If I say I am rich, I am poor, I mean I am a rich man, or I am a poor man. I don't mean a rich worm or a poor worm, I mean I am a rich man, or I am a poor man. Let me now leave off for one moment, imagining myself to be poor. And where do you suppose that I, the poor man, would be? Where do you suppose I would be a poor man if I left off for one moment, imagining that I am poor? It would vanish and leave no trace behind it. If I dare to leave off imagining that I am limited. Then the being that is assuming, by imagining, by dreaming itself limited, it will simply cease to be. I am can cease to be, and I am man can cease to be. But every claim that I make for myself as man will cease to be if I stop imagining it. And so here, yet thou art our father, O Lord. Thou art our partner. And father, thou art my imagination. So I am saying that I am is the father, and these are my imagination. That's what that chapter is telling me. It's the 61st chapter, the 7th and 8th verses of the book of Isaiah. He said, I am the Lord, this is the other. I form light and create darkness. I make real and create wealth. I, the Lord, do all these things. There is there a power in the world to do anything but. But what an indictment. There is no one that calls upon thy name. No one bestows himself to take hold of thee. What an indictment. And now we are told, why do you hide your face? And then he tells us, in the 31st chapter of the book of Deuteronomy, why he hides his face from our wickedness. And he does it because we have turned to other gods. The only reason in the world that he hides his face from man is because man turns to other gods. If man did not turn to another god, and trust only the one god, which is I am, 
There was nothing impossible to us, but nothing. The minute he turns to another God and rationalizes anything, but then he's turned from the only God, and he brings upon himself strange things and all the wickedness of the world. If I dare to assume that this building is mine, it's now found by the club. The club has hundreds and hundreds of members, and so it belongs to the members, it's the club. But without consulting the members, if I did not rationalize it, try to scheme to get it, if I so desired this building, and I dare to assume that it is mine, just as though I would say the tie is mine, I might raise the finger to make it so, or to rationalize it, or to in any way influence anyone in the class to become a spokesman for me, just it is mine. I am sleep in the assumption that it is so. In a way, I do not know without hurt to anyone, they would all want to get rid of the club and buy some other place. And it will not be a hurt to any member. No one will be hurt and all will be mutually benefited. And I will get the club. If I so desire it. God forbid. But nevertheless, that's how the law works. Now let me tell you a story. I want you all to really take it seriously and write me a story. You can write them this week if you really will apply it. You first must accept the fact there's only one God and that one God is not outside. He is your own wonderful human imagination when you say, I am has no form, but if I am man, he has a form. That God. God of a man, God is no more. I am, that's God. You start right there. Now, a gentleman wrote me a letter which I received last Thursday night. He is here tonight, he and his wife and a friend. He did not tell me that the tell it in the cat form, but I'm going to tell it. It's a very lovely thing. No one but the gentleman, his wife and his friend, know who they are. But it's a wonderful story, and you should hear it. So I live in the hills above Sunset Strip. Twenty feet behind my place, my property, is cleared, and then a straight cliff of thirty feet of decomposed granite. It was cut when my home was built. And behind that, rising, say, two hundred feet, is a sheer cliff, covered in brush, for above my home, and behind and above another home. That home was built afterwards. Two years ago, my broker, the handled by insurances, my fire insurances, notified me that because of a disastrous fire in the area, no company would cover my property. And so, those who held it would not renew it. One come one chap say, if you would clear 75 feet beyond your property, a very brush, and then plant ice more, then we might consider it. Well, first of all, the 75 feet beyond my property was not my property, so I couldn't clear it. And secondly, I'm quite sure the owner would not allow it to be cleared, for the first rain, the whole thing would come tumbling down. And secondly, he would not allow it to be planted, and I wouldn't allow it, in high spot. So, my, my policy left. It was then that I came across your book, The Law and the Promise. I did not know then that you lived in the city and that you gave lectures. But I imagine what it would be like if I heard you lecture. And crazy enough, I saw this place here just as it is today, with this exception. There was no stage, and the chairs were more comfortable. And that's something I can do nothing about. But the chairs were more comfortable. Then he said, I saw you enter stage right. And then, as we entered, or rather, entered into the question theater. This is just an introduction into the book, The Law and the Promise. 
Having read it, I saw the love near my problem I am not covered. So I will take in my imaginary hand a policy and just feel it. And so I felt the policy in my hand. And when I began through the day to think in terms of the problem and to talk mentally with anyone, I came back to the end, the policy in my hand. And every time that I was diverted, trying to rationalize it, I came back to the end, the policy in my hand. Well, the next day, a woman called me who takes care of my accounts. She's in the office of my business manager. She called on an entirely different matter. But while I had her on the wire, I told her of my difficulty. And she says that her office takes care of the tax returns of another broker. That she would talk to him that day and call me back, which she did. And so that he agreed to take half the policy. He would send his investigators around to examine the property. Then I found myself talking with these investigators mentally, trying to persuade them that brush was essential, that you had to have brush or the very first rain, or the decomposed granite would come down, which I knew when this man built his home 200 feet behind and above me. For the first rain, my yard was filled with this decomposed granite, and it took the man himself over a week to cut it away. So I knew the brush was essential. But then again, I said, I am not doing the right thing. Here I am talking with these people mentally. Then I must go back to the policy. So he goes back to the policy in his hand. Why do I go to these men at all? Let them come and see the property. But I will simply go to the end and hold the policy in my hand. Which he did. The woman called him back the next day and said that the new broker had found another insurance company that was willing to take the other half of the policy without investigation, without any clearing of brush. But there would be a $300 surcharge, an increase in the taxes. But the man who arranged the whole thing said that he could juggle the policy and then take it off at some other place in the policy. Therefore, really, in the end, he would not be paying any more. The $300 would be taken from elsewhere in the policy by a certain juggling of, I don't know what it is, but he juggled the policy. So really they only paid the same amount of money that they intended to pay. Then he says, we had an enormous rain a month later. I had my policy completely covered now. And there was a huge rain. And brush and no brush came an enormous amount of that hill right down into my yard. I looked at it and I said, at least two full truckloads. Too much for a big trucking company and not enough. I mean, too much for a little trucking company and not enough for a big trucking company. So I looked at it, where would I turn? To whom would I go? And so I looked at the whole thing and I thought, the hell with it. I will now see nothing but green there. Just as I did before, I will see green. I will even see this decomposed stuff in my yard. So it's my custom that I go for a two or three mile walk every morning. I take my car down to the foot of the hill and walk on flatter ground which is such that strip. And so I take my walk in sunset. As I came back and got into my car, there was a man standing his way asking for a ride up the hill. So I gave him a lift. And he told me that he washed his cars for a living. But the rain had washed all the cars and he'd had no job today. So when I explained to him my difficulty was always in my yard, and he asked me if I would allow him to cart it away for me, that he charged a dollar and a quarter an hour. I told him that wasn't enough. He said, that's my price, and I don't want to disturb it, a dollar and a quarter an hour. So that day, he carted the entire amount under the adjoining vacant lot and covered up all the dry brush, and therefore brought down the hazard. For all this was very, very dry and brittle, and by covering the entire area with this enormous amount in his yard, it simply lessened the fire hazard. The next day, he called again, and he said, the cars are still clean. I wondered if you could give me a job today. Well, he said, I have wanted for the longest while to plant some roses near a certain fence of mine. But there was a hedge there, 
And so I said to him, you could move the head up against the heel, all well and good. So that's exactly what I've seen me all over the place. So I went out and got through with the job. When I came back, the whole place was green as I had in my imagination had seen it. Now, he said, I must tell you something about this man. His name is Eddie. That's all I call him. He introduced himself as Eddie. He said, I think he's my bad dream. Because I can't seem to do anything for Eddie. I can't now even bring him into my mind. I try to see him in a different state, and I failed. I can't even bring him into my mind now. But this is Eddie. He is 54 years old. And in the 30s, his mother died, and he tried to commit suicide. Well, he failed, and he was put into an asylum, further, mildly insane. He felt himself an outcast, a social outcast, and unwanted. And so the stranger who wrote the letter said, of course, I can see that this hotel when he goes to a bathtub, and so he has a point there if he's unwanted. But nevertheless, he feels unwanted, and so he ran away from this asylum. The police got him and brought him back. The asylum didn't want him, neither did the police want him. So he was set free. And he lived on a hundred dollars a month from a twenty thousand dollar trust fund of what he can make from washing cars and odd jobs. But Eddie, when he saves a few dollars, he goes to the desert to hunt for gold. Or he goes to the mountains. He calls it my perspective act. Well, this day, a few months ago, he went off on his great act. And as he was approaching the hill in the distance, he heard a voice say, I am. He was startled. He looked around, not a soul in sight for miles around. The voice repeated itself this time louder, I am. This time he thought it must be coming from some helicopter, maybe some person with a peer system. It's simply speaking from above, so he looked up, not a thing in the sky. And so, the third time the voice came back, do not come up here. I am. But he was curious, so he started towards the top of the hill where he thought this time it came from the hill. When he got up to the hill, there he came across a four foot rattler. It wasn't cold, just stretched out, staring at him. But he said he didn't have a human face. And he didn't think he'd have to put it in his purse, as the lady did. He simply ran. Now that is any story, he said, just as it happened. And so I will share it with you and tell you as it was told to me. Now, maybe I shouldn't work my imagination any more for Eddie. Maybe Eddie is on a higher level of consciousness than I am. Eddie heard as everyone will one day hear, as coming from without, what actually is whispered from within. When you read it in the third chapter of Exodus, and the Lord God said unto Moses, Go say, I am that I am. And when they ask you, Who sent you? Just say, I am has sent you. It's written so that when you read it, you will think a man heard a voice actually coming from without from some bush, and out of that bush a voice is speaking to a man. No. He heard as coming from the doubt what really was whispered from the depths of his soul. I am. And we tell about the burning bush, if you've never witnessed it, I can tell you, your whole being becomes a flame. And you see it. I have seen it in subways. I've seen it on the stage. I have seen it about where I am. Suddenly the whole being is though you're on fire, and you wonder why you aren't burning. So you're told of this bush, it burned, and yet it did not consume. It burned, and the tree was not consumed. I have been in the subway, the oncoming sub, and the whole area is a flame, it's burning. But the burning is something like spirit burning. If I took alcohol and burn it, and the whole thing is alive, it's not like a gas jet, where the burning flame is constant. It's not that kind of a flame. It is a moving flame like spirit. If I pour brandy over a plum pudding and live it, and the whole thing becomes alive and it moves all over, it burns just like that. And you are the center of the entire burning. 
is from the depths of your own soul that you hear it. It hears, you hear it, and you think it's coming from the mouth. It's not coming from the mouth. It's coming from the very depths of your soul. I am. So, Eddie, living in a tent up in the hill, that's his home, a tent, with a trust fund of 20000 paying him $100 a month, and that he can pick up washing cars and doing odd jobs like cleaning off the yard of this gentleman, and things of that sort. But he wants not a thing beyond that. He doesn't want to disturb even his dollar twenty-five hour. The gentleman is quite willing, I'm quite sure, to give him two to clear the whole thing to an hour. No, he didn't want that. He wanted a dollar and a quarter an hour. And so I will say to him, he's in the audience, just let Eddie go. The voice is calling out, and to Eddie it seems to come from way out in space. Even so far up in the sky, he thinks some helicopter is passing by with a PS system. It must be from there because it seems so much on the outside of Eddie. It is on the outside. But that voice calls and calls and calls. So when we hear these words, there is no one that calls upon thy name. No one bestows himself to take hold of thy name. So are we turning on the outside? And we are told the one grand scene that calls into the highest place that they have turned to other gods. Today, not only the one billion Christians, but maybe 600 million Mohammedans, they turn to Mecca several times in the course of the day, flatten themselves on the sun, wherever they are, and point towards Mecca, some external God. And you go to the synagogue, and they have a holy book and a tablet, as they start reading the grand word, Yad He Bad He, if you ever gone to Shul, gone to the synagogue, the minute they come upon the word Yad He Bad He, whoever the reader covers it, was clever, that he may not look upon the holy name. If everything is on the outside. And so, this indictment, there is not one, well that seems tremendous, bold accusation, not one who calls upon thy name. Not one bestows himself to take hold of thy name. And because of this, you turn your face from us. Your face from us. And what have you done now? Not only have you turned your face from us, but you have now delivered us into the hand of our own iniquities. And we are lost in our own creations, and we don't realize it. We don't realize what we're doing. So all the wickedness that surrounds us is self-begotten. For there is only God. My Father, as you are told, the Lord, which is I am, is my Father, and my Father is my own imagination. So I am self-begotten. So I make the statement that you come out, and you alone come out, in the it must be some other thing. No, it isn't. You yourself come out of your own self-imposed brain. God comes out. There is no other. There's nothing but God. And God is your own wonderful human imagination. If you will take what this gentleman did, he read it from the book, The Law and the Promise, and he held on to feeling. He took the end. The end is where we start from. In my end is my beginning. So I go to the end. That was the end of this case. If he had the policy, and the policy was in his hand, signed by both parties, there was a contract. Must he now argue with those who come to investigate? That's behind him. The policy can't be signed and in my hand when they're still examining my property and bringing in their verdict for the ones who sent them. That must be behind me if I hold the policy. So every time he, through reason, through habit, will turn to analyze the picture and try to persuade them that this thing must be full of brush or else the first name is going to bring every, the whole hill down. And as he began to analyze it and to rationalize it, he remembered. That's not what he teaches. He teaches that you go to the end. So he took the thing once more in his hand and he held it. And felt the policy. Well, the policy could not be in his hand signed by both parties until something to be done about it. It's a contract. So the whole thing is done. If you know exactly what you hold in your hand after the event, hold it in your hand. Then let some woman call you, in his case, a woman call on a different matter. And at that very moment he thought, well, I'll tell her my difficulty. Then she knew someone whose tax return her office took care of. 
as you would see in that day, and told that. The man, without seeing it, he took it, sent the people over yet. And the second party, the next day, they didn't even come to see the property. They made no request to remove the brush, and took the other half of the policy. And the $300 surcharge was adjusted so that it wasn't really $300 more anyway. So I say to you, believe me, not a thing comes into your world that you did not draw by some imaginal act. Not a thing happens to man, no matter how wicked it is, that he himself does not bring it into the world by his own imaginal act. Imagining creates reality. Believe me. Because imagining is God in action. Imagination is God. Imagining is God in action. If you prefer the word God and Christ, well then God is your imagining, your imagination, and Christ is your imagining. That is the activity of imagination. Why well, say man's imagination is manifested in the imaginations of men. But the one who took the other half without even investigating, he had to, for the policy was in the man's hands. And so there was a mutual benefit to the entire picture. So I know from the big fire we saw here one night, my dentist, he was right in the midst of all the flames that were all falling all around. I went through this door here, into my little room at the back, and saw these things going up in flames, one after the other. Jim's house didn't have one, sh one shingle. And I can see the tree now, Eucalyptus tree, that was completely fair on one side, Outside of his property, and yet not on the inside. A all trees, eucalyptus, full of oil, that all goes up, filled on one side and not the other side. And the only thing that he could have lost, and some say not thinking that Jim was in the city, that he and Sarge might have been away, I know the whole thing was a claim, a thing, went up the hills, in spite of all the fire department, went into the home, and he heard a door slam. And then he thought he heard footsteps. And when he rushed into the dining room, someone, like so many people, were like wolves. They lived on the hurts of others. They think that way. And someone, seeing this enormous flame, knowing that no one would be in the house, rushes in, takes Jim's lovely rug, one of his scatter rugs, early entered, and this all of Jim's silver and put it into the rug. He was just about to tie it to escape. Saying the footsteps he heard, a friend of Jim's came, uninvited, and saved all the silver. So Jim did not lose one shingle, not a spoon, he lost nothing. And that Jim lived this way. He isn't here tonight, but when I went to see the home, and the brush all over the place burned, that was the night that Aldous Huxley's house went right down to the very ground. And Aldous himself, in one of his books, he said that he had motives for not wanting the world to have meaning. Consequently, he assumed that it had none, and without any difficulty, found all the reasons in the world to support his assumption. So, he wrote it in his book that the world had no meaning, he didn't want it to have meaning. So he had this most glorious library. First edition, not only his own first edition, but the ex Lawrence gave him first editions of his own lovely works, all kinds of lovely things, and art objects, which he intended someday to give to maybe UC or some other great college. And not one thing was saved, only the suit on his back and the last magistrate. Because I was really believed, seeing the whole confused world, it had no meaning. He could not believe in a God. Not really as we believe in God. He couldn't believe in his own I am this. He believed in only that which science could in some way bring up. And his own grand ancestor, Thomas Huxley. When Thomas Huxley one day was asked in the presence of another scientist, if you saw a great big object rise from here and float through space unsupported by any known power to man, what would you say that you just see? And the other scientist answered first, and he said, well, I would say I have just witnessed the suspension of the laws of gravity. Well, Thomas Huxley, being more 
I would say, profound in his thinking than the other scientists. He said, I wouldn't say that. I would say, I have just witnessed the operation of a law of which I am totally ignorant. If gravity is absolute, it can't be suspended. So if I saw what you just described, I would say, I have just witnessed the operation of a law of which I am totally ignorant. There may be a law that may operate gravity, as we understand it, doesn't function. While the other one couldn't conceive of any law coming into being that could put at naught what we consider gravity to be. Yet he didn't take that page from his ancestors' book because he really believed it had no meaning, none whatsoever. And so lived life fully of all the excitement that you could, if the body and time allowed it. But outside of that, he couldn't quite see that the meaning behind it all. I said it was meaning for every little thing that happens in this world. Another thing could happen, but nothing could happen unless it was supported by an imaginal act. Now, the imaginal act may be delayed in coming, as far as your vision goes. It's not delayed in its own motion. But you may be anxious, and you may think it's delayed. It's taking too long. It isn't taking too long for itself. Every vision has its own appointed hour. It ripens, and it will flower. If it belongs to the individual, then wait. For it is sure, and it will not be late. Just wait. You plant the natural act now, and don't waver, and you find yourself moving into some other level, come back to the end. For you always plant the end. He saw the green. A total stranger is coming his way up the hill. And he is the one to make it green. He moves his whole bit away and puts it on dry brush. And then he brings back this revelation to my friend. For a simple person living in a tent, unkempt, with little to the poetry of this world, and yet in the stillness of the desert, he could hear, I am. Don't come up here. I am. Didn't say, I am this, I am that, I am the other. Simply, I am. From the depths of his soul, it is stirring. Who is stirring? He is stirring. Trying to come to the surface. And he thinks he's on the outside. It sounds so loud when you hear it. If anyone stood in his presence, do you know no one else would have heard it? If he had a thousand people around him, he and he alone would have heard it. That's scripture. Only the one who has the experience hears it. Read it carefully. And when the dove descended, only he on whom he descended, if you read it in the first chapter of the book of Mark, it is recorded by the evangelist as though, not that he had witnessed it, that he had been told by the one who experienced it. But no one but the one who experiences these things really heard it or sees it. So Eddie could be in the presence of a thousand people, and Eddie and Eddie alone would have heard the voice he heard three times. And three times is trying to bring him into himself, but to him it seems so loud. He was coming from without, but just like a Moses. Eddie heard just what Moses heard, and that which seemed to have come from without was really coming from the depths of the soul. So to everyone here, when you read your Bible, and you come across the Lord, I am the Lord, thy God, and besides me there is no God. I am thy Savior, and there is no other Savior. You read that in the 43rd chapter of Isaiah. Now listen to these words. These are supposed to be the greatest of all the commandments. When he was asked, what's the greatest commandment? This is what he answered. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Now listen to the words. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, that's I am. Our God, our I am. Is one I am. Come from unity. Only one God. So don't be concerned about his little I am or that little I am. There's only one I am. It's all in you. 
individually. And thou shalt love the Lord, that is, the I am, which I am, your I am, with all your might, with all your heart, with all your soul. How could I love my own I am? That's what I'm accused of not doing. I think I love God, and bend my knee before some wooden object on the world, or some carved thing out of marble, or maybe some precious little diamond, where I carved the so-called image of a man and wear it around my neck. And these other little things, I put the value upon the stone, or maybe the artist who did the carving, and I completely turn to other gods. And that's when God, the real God, hides his face. If I would turn to the only God, and the only God is your own wonderful I am, has no form when you say I am, but he will have form when you say I am man. It takes all form, and when you see it, it's just like you. If I tell you over and over, when you see him, whatever you see him, you're going to see yourself. Only lifted up to the nth degree of beauty and dignity and majesty and a strength of character in your face that you wouldn't dream you would ever attain. But it's just like you. So anyone should ever come saying, look, there is Christ. Or look, here he is. Don't believe him. Why? Because the very does not yet appear what we shall be. We know when he appears, we shall be like him. And so one day you're going to see him, just as you read in that book of the late Carl Jung, as you read in my little book, The Search, where the same experience only mine preceded his by many years. It happened in 1934, and mine happened in 1934. But here you come upon a meditative being, and you look closer. And you discover you're looking at yourself. And he said that he saw this wonderful being himself, only raised to the eighth degree of beauty, his primal star, its wearing. In this fun meditation, and he knew that the way it arose, he, the one looking at it, was no longer be, because there can't be two of you. You are he. So when he awakes, this vanishes because you are he that gets your own being that you never ceases to be. So you cannot die for the simple reason you are all imagination. Man is all imagination, and God is man, and exists in us, and we in him. The eternal body of man is the imagination, and that is God himself. So really carefully, the Lord, thou art our Father, we are the clay. Thou art our partner. We are all the work of thy hand. Everything is happening to me, the work of thy hand, and it's not thy meaning a second person, but I am, or it means my imagination. The Lord is my own wonderful human imagination. If I don't believe it and turn to another God, he hides his face from me. For he is not, he is the one to whom I will turn. He is only within me as my own wonderful human imagination. I must trust him implicitly. More than anyone trusts the so-called outside God, because that outside God is a false God. We look at him. The only reason he hides his face is because they turn to other gods. In that 31st chapter, the 18th verse of Deuteronomy, there's no other reason for him turning and hiding his face. He hides it because of the many wickednesses of man, and because man has turned to another God. Any time you turn to another God, you hide yourself, hide his face. But tonight you try, and then do the thing, or do for me, what that gentleman did. That came unsolicited. I'm going to solicit your letter, your case history. I know it from this platform, read them, and talk about them, to encourage everyone who comes here to believe in the only God, the God that cannot die, the God of the living, that you may know you cannot die. You cannot even pass away 
This is the thing that is awakening the depths of your soul. And the only awakening is God. Always was God. But he thought of this wonderful experience, and there is no limit to his expansion. You've expanded all the more. There's only a limit to contraction. Only a limit to opacity. But no limit to expansion and to translucency. So after the experience there, when you wait within you, all the more translucent, all the more expansive. So now we go into the silence. And in the silence, take something. If you can find something to hold in your hand, a contract, a sum of money, an agreement, I don't care what it is, but something which implies the end has been realized. Don't argue about it, go to the end. And just if you are realizing the end and feeling the end, then all the means necessary to fulfill that end will fall into place. And you don't have to devise any means. Now let us go. Now are there any questions, please? Why did the voice say, don't come up here? My dear, I could not tell you what that meant. But anything else? To me, just the I am. But his curiosity was aroused and he was just now. The symbolism is perfect. He saw the symbol of God in action, which is a serpent. The serpent was not called to strike, therefore it was not dangerous. But he, in his frightened moment, ran, which I dare say everyone would have done. But he ran from the uncoiled rattlesnake. But a snake, a serpent, is always a symbol of Christ. And Christ is only the personification of God's activity. It is the power and the wisdom of God. And so he saw, symbolized, this power. Which if he only knows is the activity of his own I am, but then he doesn't know that yet. But luckily to us, he could tell it to a man who employed him on these two days. And therefore he took him into his confidence and told him. Maybe he would never tell it to anyone else. But he's taken this man into his confidence who has employed him, and he feels that he can trust him. And so he in turn trusted us with a perfectly marvelous revelation. For any heard in the desert, but not one person in sight, not for miles around. And it came so loudly, he looked up to the skies, thinking that an airplane, a helicopter, must be passing over with a fear system. That was his reasoning mind. Because what came to him came through, well, the conceptual mind, and therefore modified itself. But nevertheless, he did climb, even that is symbolical. He climbed the hill to see the symbol. So the whole thing was symbolical, really. Everything has meaning in this world, but I could not tell you the exact and precise meaning of don't come up here. In fact, it's a challenge, which is a very good challenge, because every time man is told not to do something, he does it. And so it could be taken in that light. Every commandment is broken because it's never to be stated, thou shalt not. I could offer you any sum of money in this world, but any sum. If I tell you, I'll give it to you, providing you do not think of a monkey. Try not to think of a monkey, but you'll never get the sum of money. The more you try not to think of that, the more that you have nothing but monkeys in the world. <laughs> Because you see the goal as against what you must not do. So thou shalt not. And if you know the story of the scripture, you broke every commandment. You broke the Sabbath day, therefore he simply turned against the Sabbath God. And so the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The women taken in adultery, the Lord said, turn her to death. He forgave her. His parents, honor your parents, honor your father and mother. He says, who are my mother and brothers and sisters? Those who do the will of him that sent me. So he denied earthly parents. 
No one does get close to my confession. I am about my father's business, and I'm a father of the gun. His own being. For I am my father of one, said he. For he denied earth to bear And for every commandment he wrote. Because they're all written negatively. Thou shalt not. But in the sermon of the mouth, the whole thing is positively done. Everything is on the positive side, nothing is stated negatively. Yes, ma'am. All the people bring it down into our air because it is the death of thou art. O Lord, I am addressing an error, am I not? O Lord, thou art our Father. Is that not the second person? Now take the word Lord and analyze it. I am addressing I am. But I am cannot be second person. Can it be? O Lord, the word Lord, is a translation of the Hebrew letters Yod A Vav A, which by definition means the self existence. I am. So the words in the third chapter of Exodus, when it is stated, go and say, I am, have sent you. The word translated I am is Yod A Vav A. The same word is translated Lord, where you see Lord in the Bible, or the use of the word Adonai. But mostly, Yod He Because the Hebrew does not like to take the name out of the army. So he tries not to pronounce the name of Jehovah. But we take, well, we don't really object to it. So we use the word Jehovah. But the Hebrew will not. It's Sunday. It's the unutterable name, which is I am. For the average person, as for the average person, the whole vast world is unwilling to assume I am an enslaver. He feels unclean. Who am I to make that claim? Because he's taught that way. The priesthood 